The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. lovely to be here. Well, we've got some important business to do today, which is why, of course, you're giving up your Saturday to come. We've got to figure this thing out, right? It's very important that we teach all of our children to read, or as many of them as we possibly can. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about here today, because we've really figured a lot out. We really know now, and that's, that's really where I want to start um, with this conversation. Um, the, the current science, the current research that should give all of us, educators, administrators, support personnel, and parents, um, I'm, I'm one of those parents. How many of you here are parents of children who struggle with reading? <sighs> me too. Yeah, me too. Um, she's not a child anymore. She's 36 years old. I can tell you from uh, my perspective now, having lived with this uh, my entire time with my dear Lizzie at 36 now. She's an incredibly capable, um, amazing young woman. She's actually in South Africa right now. Um, later this afternoon, I hope to Skype with her, check in with her. Um, she's visiting some relatives in South Africa. She works as a nanny. She is revered by the families that she has worked with. Um, reading, spelling, and writing. Uh, continue to be uh, a challenge for her. That stuff doesn't go away, but she survived it. The family survived it. Um, and we, so I, I bring that perspective too. So let's, let's go ahead and launch this conversation. That's supposed to be me there. <laughs> yes, in my professor days, but when I first saw that piece of clip art, I said, oh yeah, you know, I know who that reminds me of. So the preview to my talk today is that Meeting the needs of our children uh, who struggle with reading is not going to be done by just buying the right program, okay? It's not that easy of an answer. If it was, I would have one PowerPoint slide. I would tell you, go buy this program, and it will take care of it. Um, it's not a particular program or a set of materials. However, I do want to make the point that um, materials matter. It's, uh, there are people who have rejected materials and rejected programs and say, you know, just creative, hardworking teachers are going to do this. And, and you know, I've, I've seen those teachers. You probably know some of those teachers. Maybe some of you are those teachers who can teach kids to read with a, a, a rock, <laughs> a broken pencil, and a three-year-old newspaper, right? You know, you, you know who those people are. Um, but most of us are not those people, and most of our students have needs that are, can be supported by excellent materials. So we're going to talk about the role of materials, but it's not just one thing that we can do. But here's what we do need to know. And many of you in this room who read good, high-quality reading research have also come to this understanding. Um, this is not a, a statement of belief or philosophy. Uh, I did put my signature on it because I stand by this. This is, though, not a belief statement. It's a statement of fact. If you read um, and stay up to date on current research, you know that now we do know that somewhere in the vicinity of 90 to 95 percent of children can be taught to read at grade level. That is a fact. There are very few, but there are some, but there are very few school districts who, ach who have achieved this, and um, that's what we've got to fix, because those children who are not being taught to read, who have the capacity, and as you can see, almost all students do by this statement of fact, and this includes students with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. We're talking about all the children born into this world, whether they're born in you know, the advantage of being in Fairfax, Virginia, or they're born in some third world country, or they're born anywhere, those brains, what we're talking about is the brains. This is what uh, newest reading research has told us as we look into those brains. Almost all those brains 
have the capacity to be taught to read at grade level. And when people read at grade level, their lives change, right? Not just their lives, their children's lives, people around them. Um, we need to do this, and we now know that it's possible, and we now know how to, how to do this. And I'm not a politician, thank God I'm not a politician. <laughs> Politicians have to say 100% of kids, right? Do some of you remember the language in No Child Left Behind, which is now not any longer the, the uh, law of the land? We, we tried that, set a goal, very lofty goal, that by the end of June 2014, 100% of the children in the United States of America were going to learn to read, were going to read at grade level. <laughs> well, we didn't quite get there. And that was a goal that everybody, every educator, every knowledgeable person always laughed at when we heard it because we know, we know there are children who are not ever going to learn to read at grade level. Some of those children we know on the day they are born that they're not going to learn to read at grade level. So we do other things for those children. But outside of those children who we know so early on are not going to achieve this, almost all other children with powerful, good instruction can learn to read at grade level. And when we talk about children with dyslexia, I want to be sure that you've all stay up to date in this rapidly growing knowledge base of what dyslexia is and how we can work with these students. There's a wonderful um, webcast available online. And just let me say, um, you have access to this PowerPoint. There are handouts available for download as part of this conference. So all of these websites and things that I'm going to mention, you can look up later. But um, I've watched this webcast several times. It was a hearing at the Science, Space, and Technology Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, where they called a special session on dyslexia, um, thinking that we have science around teaching children to read and we should be sharing this. I found it very interesting, every time I watch it, there are some of the premier uh, researchers in the world um, sitting there uh, testifying at this conference. There's a parent, uh, an advocate of children with disabilities. There's a children's author who himself has dyslexia. And so they're speaking from different perspectives. But at one point, um, the chair of the committee said to these distinguished people, um, so what do you need from us? You know, after this, this information discussion, what do you need from us? I assume, you know, you need more money for more research. And one of the researchers, actually Dr. Sally Shaywitz said, um, well, I'm not going to turn down money. You know, it's, it's not that we don't need money, but that's not the main thing we need. We have figured out so much about what dyslexia is and how we ought to um, work with, with those students who have it. She said, what we really need is to get the information out. We need to get this information to teachers. That's what we need the most of. Um, and interestingly, last year, um, Congress isn't doing much these days, but they did pass a law um, uh, related to um, the identification and support of children with dyslexia. So hopefully we are making some, yeah, some progress in that area. So how are we going to get to somewhere around 90 to 95 percent? We don't know the exact number. That's why I give us a range. There are some studies that have been done where 90 percent of the children achieve grade level. Other studies where 95 percent. So it's somewhere in that range. We get there. Students succeed when they receive intensive, comprehensive, and high quality instruction. And that's, that's the kind of thing you're going to be hearing about at this conference. After this session, I'm going to do another uh, breakout session, a small session related to one particular skill, reading fluency. So you're hearing what this good instruction looks like. It's intensive, it's focused, it's systematic, um, and that's what I'm going to share today. And we also know, well, that going back there, this talks about that we do have a special window, which is really the early years, K-1-2, is really a special uh, window for helping our children become literate. But um, research also says that it's never too late when we're thinking about being able to do something with our students. There's been extensive research done with our older students, older, you know, like nine, <laughs> nine and up. Um, 
because we want to be sure that people understand that it is never too late. There are all kinds of things we can do. It gets harder. Um, we have to admit that. The brain is not quite as ready, not quite as malleable, um, but motivation can play a big role in this. The oldest person I've ever taught to read was 72 years old. I was, yeah. <laughs> You would have enjoyed meeting this guy. I was, uh, this was when I was a professor at Texas A&M. Uh, we were doing a lot of work in um, the prison system because we found out that a whole heck a uh, lot of adolescents in Texas are incarcerated. And we said, you know, we also know the statistics that many people who are incarcerated have low literacy levels. And we said, we got to do something about this. So we started working in, in some of the prisons, um, helping, while well, we were there is to work, work with the teenagers, the adolescents particularly, but while we were there and doing our thing, um, this guy, this 72 year old approached us and said, um, can you teach me to read? I never learned how to read. So he had the motivation, he was finally ready. <laughs> he told us lots of stories about being in classrooms and just not being ready and he said, I was a bad boy. <laughs> I was a bad boy, but he was ready then, and so we taught him to read. Um, okay, so see this woman here? This is you. Sorry, guys, but I just picked a woman to be representative of uh, skeptical professional educators and parents who hear this stuff like, almost all kids can learn to read, you know, and says, okay, but really, in our real world, without, we all know, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough people to do this job. Um, is this really possible? It really is. Schools have done it. So uh, part of the research that I like to do, um, you could call it a very technical kind of kind of research. We go out and study what other what we go out and study what successful schools are doing and copy them. Mm -hmm. So I learned, you know, in school I learned don't copy, you know, it's a bad thing, don't be a copycat. Now as a researcher, I go out and copy people, you know. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's go find schools that have achieved this level of 90 to 95% success, and let's just do what they do, right? Doesn't that make sense? Um, the effective schools research that I've done and other people have done always starts with an effective school. Nobody, I can tell you, nobody spends a lot of time studying ineffective schools, you know? We just, we don't have time or money to do that and they don't really want you there. <laughs> yeah. It's really easy to get into an effective school because you just, you know, you talk to the principal and say, we've identified you as an effective school and we'd like to study you. Like, come on in, you know, because they are justifiably very proud of what they've done. If we go to a school and say, you're really a failing school, we kind of like to study and publish what you're doing. Like, mm, no, thank you. So. We start by going to find an effective school, and effective schools in the research literature are usually defined as, on some scale, they've achieved at least 95% academic success with their students. What we don't study is schools that look like this. Those, there are schools like this. I, I hope you work in a school like this that is highly successful, um, and you got there with very few challenges. I mean, that's great, but we're not gonna spend time studying those schools. I mean, who cares? So you should do that. You should be 100%, you know? Um, so we don't study those schools. We study these schools, mm -hmm. these schools, who somehow have achieved 90% or higher success with their students despite huge challenges. So you know what the challenges are, right? Poverty, mobility, kids are coming and going all the time. Um, lots of cultural diversity, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing, but it does make teaching sometimes a little bit more difficult. Lack of parental involvement. I mean, we, we know what those challenges are. Well, there are schools who have all those challenges and yet achieve those high success. So what do they do? Carolyn Denton, my colleague and I, a few years ago, started looking at the research. We, we were doing some of this research, I said, by actually going to schools, but we said, let's look big. 
let's look at the studies that have already been done and see if we can find a pattern. What are all these schools doing, whether they are very rural schools, you know, in the, in the rural southwest of the United States, or they're big urban schools right smack in the middle of Chicago, or they're high schools or middle schools or elementary schools. Um, what are they doing that we can copy? So what we found was, we found five things, which was also very good. We wanted not to find 127 things. You know, here are, here are the 57 things that you can do to make your school better. We found five things, because we can wrap our head around that. And we were also very excited when we realized these five things, if we looked at the first letter of each of the components, it formed an acronym. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, we're in public education. We don't do anything if it doesn't have an acronym, right? So SALES is the acronym. And once you get an acronym, then you can come up with cheesy sayings, like <laughs> set your sales for success. So what are those magical five components? Well, they're not magic. You're going to see standards, assessments, instruction and intervention, leadership, and a sustained commitment. That's what we found in all of the schools that achieved that level of success. They didn't just do these things, because every school is doing these things. They did them at a particular level of rigor and commitment. So I want to walk you through some of the highlights of what we learned from looking at these schools. Uh, standards. Everybody has standards these days. Um, and thanks to, in large part, to the leadership of the state of Virginia, we now, in this country, have a common set of standards that many people are using, and they're rigorous. They're rigorous standards. And because these schools that we're talking about have lots and lots of challenges, one of the things we noticed that these schools do is they pay attention to the key standards. They don't just say, all the standards for everybody, because that's not really possible always. So what are the essential ones? What are the ones we're going to commit to? What are the ones that we are going to do everything we can so that every single one of our children who has the potential of meeting this standard is going to and, and prioritize them a little bit? And then we also noted that these, not only do they value their standards and pay close attention to them um, and identify key ones, then they commit to all students being able to achieve them. So um, it's a dual kind of thing of focus on the standards and a commitment to using them to set standards for all students. The assessment piece. Well, first of all, do we all agree, parents, teachers, administrators, specialists, we're doing too much testing? That's always an applause line, yes. We are doing too much testing, but on the other hand, as professional educators, we need data. We gotta figure out how to collect data um, that makes us smarter and better able to find the children who need help, figure out what help they need, um, and monitor the progress or lack of progress and do something different or keep doing what we're doing. And all these schools did that. We found that all these schools do screening assessments, diagnostic assessments, progress monitoring assessments, and by law, all schools have to do some kind of outcome measures. But one of the differences that was very clear is that these schools knew why they were doing these different assessments. They were really focused around answering some key questions. So in terms of benchmark screening, we need to use assessments that are quick, really quick, and, and reliable. We can trust them, um, and, and consistent, and valid. And because we need to answer the question, which of our students might need some extra help, especially in the early grades, and especially at the beginning of the year, this is a question that should be on the mind of every single teacher on the first day of school. Which of my kids are going to need some extra help? Because I don't have enough time, money, or people to waste any time. We've got to get to instruction. So there are assessments that can do that. And, and um, uh, uh, these schools seem to know that. Once we found a student who might need help, the next question um, is what kind of help do they need? What are their strengths? What are their needs? And we have assessments that can quickly 
give us that information. Once instruction has started, we need to be answering the question, asking the question, um, are the students actually learning something? That's the next question. And the outcome assessment is really the standards-based instruction. But I find that the schools who don't start with assessments, they don't start with the data, they start with the questions. What are the key questions we need to answer? Then go looking for the quickest, most effective uh, assessment that will answer that question. We need to start thinking about differentiating assessment in the same way we differentiate instruction. Not all kids need the same types and amounts of assessment. And it's, uh, when it's driven by questions, it helps a lot. The other thing we notice about these high effective school, highly effective schools, um, is that they don't just collect the data, they do a couple of other things. One is that they share the data. This is very clear um, when you look at this research base, is that there's lots and lots of collaboration around the data. Um, and those, they have meetings, yay, meetings, but you, <laughs> real hard to collaborate if you don't have some way of meeting with people. But these meetings are very focused. They're focused around the data. They're very collaborative. They're very non-judgmental. This is not about sitting around a table and saying who's a good teacher and who's a bad teacher. The focus is around kids. Which of our children are succeeding? Which of our children aren't? How can we help each other? We don't, let's just admit, we don't have enough time, money, or people, so that's out of the way. We call that a wind party. Yes, let's, <laughs> let's have a wind party. Okay, let's whine about money, time, people. Um, and then we'll get to work. So we are focused. We have them as frequently as we need to. Um, some schools, when we, we work with them, we start off with a fall, middle of the year, end of the year meetings. And as soon as those are going well, we increase the frequency so that um, we can really be monitoring our students. So they're public. There's a group of us, non-judgmental, collaborative. Um, and it really transforms schools. There was an article um, a couple of few years now um, LA was trying this in some of their schools, and almost universally, when collaboration around data starts, teachers are uncomfortable with it. You know, we're kind of used to, historically, sitting in our own rooms, looking at our own data, and nobody comes around and, you know, looks at our data with us. Um, and so here, the principal put scores on the wall. I'm not sure that I would do it that way, but um, they started to discuss why some of the teachers were doing better than others. And again, you know, this is not perfect. Um, that's not the way I would do it. It's not talking about who's, what teachers are doing better or not. It's who, which of our students are doing well or not. But um, the teachers began through this process to recognize areas that they need help. And one of the teachers said, eventually, you start to question yourself, and that's the whole point. We can get help when things aren't working. And this is not just at elementary schools. A middle school tried the same thing, and here's teacher, not surprised, said it was uncomfortable at first. But at that level of transparency help, we could see how we needed to improve and how we could help each other. That is what happens when we start um, doing this data sharing. The other thing that these highly effective schools did, uh, different than some, is they actually used the data. I know, really. <laughs> Not just collect the data and fill out the spreadsheets and do the forms and send them off to where they need to do, but collect it for a purpose. Because they started with an important question. They used a good assessment to quickly answer that question. They got their answers. They figured out what to do. And then they used the data. That makes a big difference as well. OK, how about the middle um, letter of here, the I, the instruction and intervention. Of course, that's going to be part of an academic model. Um, I think of the I in the sales model as the, as the mast on the sailboat, right? This is holding the whole thing up, instruction and intervention. And we could spend, I mean, I have, you know, a few minutes left here, really, but we could spend days talking about effective instruction. So the purpose of the sales model was to bring everything together, you know, to synthesize it down. So here are the three, there are only three, three big ideas on this sheet when we synthesize down what's, what is essential about instruction and intervention that works. Three things. And the first one should never surprise any educator. The first one is, number one, effectively organize and manage the classroom environment. Stop right there. 
Because if we don't have a well-organized and well-managed classroom, instruction is not going to happen. Learning is not going to happen. And instruction is, is not going to be optimized. And too many of us, we hear it in the, uh, we hear it all the time, teachers talking about the fact that they didn't learn how to organize and manage a classroom. And we're, we're not, we're just, we're also not talking in this day and age of our modern standards, we're not talking about teachers who know how to get their kids to sit in rows with their hands on the desk and their mouths quiet and staring straight ahead and sitting there all day long being the passive recipients. No, 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 no. As my three-year-old grandson says to me all the time, no, 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 no. No, we're not talking about that kind of organization and management. We're talking about a classroom that empowers kids, that gets them talking, gets them collaborating, gets them working together. Uh, it is a busy, not chaotic, but active environment these days. How do you organize that? And how do you manage that? That's job one in instruction and intervention. We've got to figure out how to do that. The next thing is how do we plan these lessons? Okay, we've got data, right? We know who our kids are. We've got that data. We're going to plan lessons. And, and then we're going to deliver using strategies and materials uh, to talk about that. And I'm going to come back before we're finished, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those three things. But I want to finish walking you through the sales model. The L in sales is about leadership. If you think about what I've shared with you so far, the S, A, and I, the standards, the assessment, the instruction and intervention, that's really the work of teachers. The teachers and the specialists do that work. And there are a lot of schools that have amazing teachers and specialists working very, very hard um, and doing wonderful things. But very rarely can just S, A, and I raise a school up to 90 to 95% success. We need some other things, two other things. One of them is leadership. And so wonderful that here in Fairfax, you clearly have committed, passionate leaders who support what's, what's happening in the classroom, creating conferences like this, actually attending conferences like this. It makes a big difference, because we need leaders who provide vision, where are we going on this sailboat? Um, guidance, how do we get there? And support for doing that. We need that vision, guidance, and support to make sure that our instruction and interventions are actually aligned to the standards and are being applied to all students. Um, we need to make sure that we're collecting the good evidence and that we're using that evidence to um, to deliver, plan and deliver our instruction. And then um, focused and sustained professional development because our profession is really complicated. Teaching is hard work, hard work, and complicated work. And it's getting more complicated because of the increasing diversity and range of needs that our students have. So we need to, all of us, all of us continue to learn um, and um, get support through coaching. Uh, all, of, all of that can uh, help us achieve what these other schools have achieved. The S in sales is a sustained commitment, and this might be the hardest thing of all to do uh, in schools, because the way our school structure is set up, everything is so politicized. Um, our wonderful leaders at the superintendent level um, rarely stick around long enough to help us sustain a commitment. They do wonderful things, and then they leave and go somewhere else, and somebody else comes in, and we change things. And that's, so this sustained commitment um, to these things, we noticed it makes a big difference. One is adapting as part of your culture, a no excuses model. Let's admit we don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. And there's a lot of other things we could talk about. Those are challenges. That's the difference. In these highly successful schools, they know that they don't have enough time, money, people, and a lot of other challenges. They're aware, but they treat them as challenges, not excuses. OK, with not enough time, what are some things that we could do to maximize our time? Let's cut back on the kind, number of assessments. Let's cut back those long assessments we're doing. Let's cut back on meetings that aren't focused on our student success. What are some things that we can do? Challenges, not excuses. Um, partnership. We need our parents. Administrators, specialists, teachers need to work together um, on our focus. Yeah, that's right. 
And we need to have collaboration. Collaboration among classrooms, a collaboration across programs, collaboration with home. These are the kinds of things that is going to make um, every school as successful as some of these schools that we studied. We also know there's no really shortcuts here in our research, in our work with schools. All five of these elements need to be in place. You can't just pick and choose. But the point here, too, is that, admittedly, the sales model is an, an academic model. And we cannot, as, as the opening <laughs> remark said, we have to be paying attention to the social emotional um, a aspect of our students' lives. So I think of that, and that's not particularly covered um, specifically in the sales model. We were looking at the academic side of things. But I like to think of creating this beautiful sales ship with a nice, strong mast um, of intervention instruction and then launching it out into a tranquil sea um, that has been created created by having all those wonderful behavioral and social emotional supports in place. That creates the place where we can sail um, this boat to success. The state of Washington, when I was working there um, as an executive consultant, that was the title they gave me, um, we used the sales model to create a statewide plan for literacy in the state, and that's still available on their website if you want to take a look at it. Um, we also, on uh, our website, GHA, stands for Gibson Hasbrook Associates, uh, hyphen PD, because that's what we do, professional development. At gha-pd.com, um, we have a website that has uh, some resources on there. We have products, too. We're happy to sell you products if you want to look at products. But we have resources, including this sales needs assessment, where you can go and download this and do a self-analysis um, of your situation. I think this is, can be a very effective tool for uh, a collaborative team, a, a leadership team, to sit down and honestly look at where are we doing well in the sales framework and where are some things that maybe we can um, target for improvement. So that's available to you too. So in the sales model, for the rest of our time here together, um, I want to focus in on the most important piece of this. All of the five are important, essential in fact, but the instruction and intervention. Because we're talking about reading specifically, I am anyway, and reading is complicated. Um, uh, Louisa Motes told us this back in 1999, and it hasn't gotten any easier. Um, it's highly complex that that belief system that some people mistakenly have that reading is a naturally occurring thing. If you just leave kids alone and put them in a language rich environment that suddenly literacy will happen. Well, um, maybe. I can't say it won't because I have two kids. Uh, my uh, first born was uh, my son Isaac who uh, one day at age four just opened a book and started to read it. Like, Oh, it's that easy, huh? <laughs> That's great that that happens. There are some kids who just, I'm like being around literacy, being read to, being talked to, um, having a lot of language rich experiences, they teach themselves to read. And I thought, well, I'm pretty good at this, right? <laughs> and then God gave me Lizzie, the little dyslexic who um, is the epitome of reading is not natural. Because is she smart? Oh yeah, she's smart. Well, she's got the genes, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> she's super smart, highly intelligent, um, very verbal, super talented in so many things, and that was evident from early age. But as um, formal literacy uh, came into her life, for the first time, she started failing at things. Um, and we had to think very differently about this complex thing that we were asking to her to do. Reading can be taught, though, to almost all children. Um, certainly, Liz uh, Lizzie had lots of good teaching along the way, and, and she, she learned to read. You know who that is? That's not me. <laughs> well, I guess it is me in a certain way. That's my favorite piece of clip art for teachers. And again, gentlemen, I'm sorry, I picked a woman, but that's the demographics, right? You knew that was a teacher, right? Because of the golden jewel-encrusted crown? <laughs> right. That one that they put on your head when you graduated from college? I don't remember that? Um, I love the crown, but it's the sword. That's why I picked it to represent teachers. What she has in her hand, what teachers, what we have in our hands is the sword of instruction. 
one of the most powerful things in the universe is the sword of instruction. What we know about instruction, it's the quality of teachers. It's lovely to have a beautiful f building, a beautiful facility. It's wonderful to have all this great technology. It's wonderful to have all the resources that we need. But when it comes down to it, the research just comes back over and over and over again. All those things are wonderful, but it's the teacher himself or the teacher herself that makes the difference. That sword of instruction, oh yeah. Let's give it. Yeah. But I want you to be in a beautiful building. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, let's take that away. Let's give you 50 kids and put you out in a garage and you can do this. Um, no, we're, we deserve all that wonderful support. But powerful instruction is po more powerful than poverty. It's more powerful than IQ, family status, language levels, all these things that for, uh, you know, we've used as excuses for so long. We now know that powerful instruction can, can rip through many of those and, 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 have, and make learning actually happen. Uh, it's instruction that makes the difference. So we talked in the sales model about three things. Organizing and managing, organizing and managing the classroom, planning instruction, and then delivering instruction. So I want to give you some more background ideas, some more details about that. In terms of organizing and managing the classroom, from pre-K, three-year-olds, up through graduate school, we have found that there are some specific tools that can be used age appropriately. I mean, you don't do the same thing for three-year-olds as you do for 17-year-olds or as you do for doctoral students in a, in a classroom. But we need to have a schedule. If I've got an hour with my students or I've got five hours with my students, how am I going to maximize that time? Time is one of our biggest challenges. <laughs> And we've got to be sure that we know how are we using our time to maximize that instructional opportunity. A job chart, uh, we, we give different names to this uh, across the grade levels. It can be a, a business center. But the idea here is that many of the managerial issues that need to be taken care of in a classroom can be done by the kids, including, yes, three-year-olds. We've used this system with three-year-olds where they are in charge of timing the lessons and moving kids from center to center and organizing, uh, cleaning up the areas and communicating with the teacher and problem solving with children. We can take a lot of the things that we spend our time with in the classroom that are not directly related to teaching and give them to our students. Um, and then some kind of system so that I can work with a small group of students, a differentiated um, a small group of students that can change, flexible grouping. We don't put kids in the low group anymore, in the high group anymore. Um, that's not productive. But sometimes I need to work with a certain group of students um, where the other students need to be doing something else. So organizing that, um, teaching uh, expectations, identifying boundaries and those kinds of things. So um, again, on our website, Gibson Hasbrook, we have resources available there for how to do this kind of classroom organization and management from pre-K all the way through high school if you want some ideas around that. In terms of planning lessons for differentiated instruction, I love this framework developed by some of my Texas colleagues. Um, there's many ways of planning lessons, but this is just one framework. We need to look at the content, the activities, how we're going to deliver the instruction, and what materials we're going to use. That's a, a good starting place for planning. The content is what we're going to teach, the skills, strategies, objectives. Content decisions. How do we make the decisions about what we're going to teach? Just like, oh, it's a nice rainy day, let's talk about rain. Mm, that's the way we used to teach, very haphazard, and uh, the standards that we're working with these days don't us allow us to have that level of flexibility. Um, in the sales model, we are very clearly guided in what we're supposed to teach by the standards and the assessment results. We start with the standards, we know what our students need, and then we go with the flow on a particular day. I was going to teach, you know, whatever, paragraph organization, and it's a rainy day, so let's incorporate rain in our, pro, you know, paragraph organization, whatever it is, but we've got to have a plan. Um, activities, what the students do and the teachers do, how we're going to actually deliver instruction, um, and the materials that we're going to use. And then, 
once we've got a good plan, we've got our classroom organized, managed, kids are, are ready to go, um, we've got a good lesson ready to go, um, and now we're going to deliver the instruction using appropriate strategies and materials. So please note the word materials. When I started speaking with you this morning, I said it's not going to be just materials. It's going to be other things. But materials made the list. And I have to say, um, you know, this morning, Everybody was introduced and we we're saying thank you to the various people that are you know, providing the coffee, yay, and the pizza later, yay. And um, we thanked specifically Shirley Ferris from Voyager Sopris who provided me <laughs> um, the covered expenses so that I could be here today. That's uh, Sopris, Voyager Sopris is a publishing company. I work with various publishing companies and they're all great people, but their job is to create and sell materials. And more than once, I have to tell you, when I've made this presentation on sales, and I'll have people like my colleague Shirley sitting in the audience, some of them afterwards have come up, these are publishers, remember? And then they will come up to me and say, oh, that, you know, that was so lovely, you did such a nice job, all this nice stuff, and then they say, but, but on that one slide where you're talking about materials, would it be possible to move materials a little higher on that list? <laughs> You know, as publishers, that's a very fair thing for them to say. And I have to say, you know, first of all, I say thank you for all those kind words, but no. <laughs> I can't move materials higher on the list because this is research-based. I didn't make this up. This didn't come out of my head. This came out of what research says. So pay attention to the fact that there's not much on this list. And materials made it. So it's not that they're insignificant, they are highly significant, but they come after all these things. You've got to organize your classroom, you've got to plan, you go, need had to know the strategies to deliver, and then you can use those good materials optimally. Um, so yes, as I said, it's not the materials that are going to make a difference, but they do make a difference. So we look for materials that are age appropriate, matched to the identified needs, oh, we could spend an hour or so talking about that, you can have an excellent program, know how to use it really well, it's done amazing things for some of your students, but it might not work for all of them, so we need to be matching them. Um, appropriate to their skill level, we want some evidence of effectiveness, just like, oh, I went to, you know, I heard about this or I read about this in a magazine or somebody else is using this. We, not in this day and age. We've got good evidence that some of these things work and some of them we have poor evidence, so let's go for the evidence. We need to know how to do it, professional, sufficient professional development, and then let's use it the way it was designed to be used, and then we'll get good use out of our materials. But how about the strategies? Going back to what I shared with you at the beginning, um, strategies is how we're going to get to 90 to 95 percent, and those instructions, uh, those components, the instruction is three things that I know you've all heard about. We talk about them all the time, systematic, explicit, intensive instruction. Well, what does that look like? Um, systematic instruction, systematic instruction, the sexiest two words that we have in education. Yeah, get ready for this. When we're talking about systematic instruction, what we mean is scope and sequence. Woo, there I said it. Those sexy words. Nothing less sexy than scope and sequence. And yet it's the first thing here that we need to talk about because a scope is how much we're going to try to teach. It's the plan. And sequence is the order in which we teach it. And every one of us who went to college to learn how to be a teacher, somewhere along the line, we talked about scope and sequence. And it's treated often as a, you know, not that important thing. It's essential. We don't have enough time, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough people, we've got high standards, we've got kids who depend on us, we gotta figure out what we are going to try to teach during this semester, this year. That's the scope, and then the sequence is what order. That, right there, folks, is one of the reasons we should depend on materials, because we are too busy meeting the individual daily needs of our kids to figure out a scope and sequence that matches with my previous grade, my next grade, kids in all different levels. That's what good materials do for you. 
That's a role that I play with some of the publishers that I work with as we sit down and come up with a scope and sequence and then plan a program around it to make that work. So I'm a, I mean, it's part of what the research says, you've got to have systematic instruction. You've got to have a plan, and that's what scope and sequence is. Um, and lots of reviews built into it, too. Explicit instruction, what does that mean? Three steps, I know you've heard them all. You show the students what it is you want them to do, not make them guess. We don't have enough time to let them guess. Sometimes we should do some things like exploration or, or um, you know, discovery learning. There's a place for that, but most of the time, if we're teaching skills, we don't have time for that. Discover what the letter D says. Go ahead, figure out, discover how to uh, read a three-syllable word. No, no. Show them how to do that. Give them some guided practice. Here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. Do it with me. Let's do it some more. Do it with me again. OK, I think you got it. Now you get independent practice. Do it by yourself. You got it? Good. Let's go on to four-syllable words. Or you didn't get it? I'll show you again. We'll do more guided practice. And then we'll see if you've got that. Um, nowadays, in the era of new, higher standards, some people have suggested, and I think they're right, that we should, should add a fourth step. We should keep the demonstration step, the I do, I do, watch me, my turn, watch me. The second step, the guided practice, stays right where it is. We do it together. Let's do it together, let's sound it out, let's figure out how to do it, I'll give you some feedback. And the fourth step, the you do, we need to stay that. But after that second step, I do, we do, fourth, the third new step is y'all do. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what we call it in Texas when I was there, y'all do it. Collaboration step. Once the kids have learned how to do it with my guidance, they collaborate together. A group of six-year-olds can read words together and sound out, read to each other, give each other feedback. A group of 12-year-olds can be working on a list of, of multisyllable words and, and um, uh, some morph morph morphological um, uh, exploration, the collaborative um, step. But then they're all held to individual accountability with the you-do step at the end. Active engagement. Teachers need to learn to talk less. <laughs> um, let's do that demonstration step and get it out of the way and then get to the teaching so that students are actively engaged. They are reading orally so we can hear them and give them some feedback. We have them writing, encoding, and spelling. We keep deepening our learning about the critical importance of teaching reading and spelling together. Um, the more that we, and not spelling a list of uh, vocabulary words, learning to spell or encode the words they're learning to read. That fires up uh, many different parts of, of the brain. Spell those reading words, write those reading words, spell those reading words, um, the, the high frequency irregular words as well as the decodable words. Those are the words that should, we should be spelling. And our kids need to be talking. They need to be discussing, they need to be sharing, they need to be collaborating. We can start that at age three with good guidance, um, and it's a powerful way for us to all learn. Intensive instruction. There needs to be a sense of urgency. You can, you can cut back on the, you can take your foot off the gas pedal a little bit. I, I would think if you are already at 90 to 95 percent in your school, keep, you know, keep striving for 100 percent. But if you're down where a lot of schools are around, 60% success, academic success, 70, even 80% academic success. There needs to be a sense of urgency. Um, I attended a workshop recently where the speaker said she wanted to go into classrooms and see teachers running around as if their hair is on fire. And I thought, oh, I don't want to see that. I don't like that image at all because that sounds like frantic to me. I've been in too many classrooms where it looks like the teacher's running around with their hair on fire. And i like, no, 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 no. There's my grandson again. No, 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 no. Urgency, a sense of urgency and purpose, but focus. Where's my focus? Standards, assessment data, instruction and intervention. I have a focus and I have a sense of urgency. I keep the pace up and let's keep learning because this is exciting and this is wonderful, but it's not frantic. It's the opposite of frantic, but it's also relentless. 
Those high achieving schools do not use excuses. I can't tell you um, how many principals, tears running down their face, passionate professional educators who are saying, we are so challenged, but we are not going to give up. When kids are in our building, even if they're here for an hour, we're going to do our best um, to help them along this learning path, that level of commitment, um, and focused. Without enough time, money, or people, we need to be very focused. What does our data tell us that our students need? What are the key skills from the standards that we've identified and the skills instruction? Um, and, and link all of that to the standards. And there's our teacher again. When we're providing this really, really powerful good instruction, how do we know it works? Well, we can, we can watch our students. We can do assessments with our students. Um, Neuroimaging, any of you have a neuroimaging, a magnetic functional imagery <laughs> machine in the back of your classroom? No? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, researchers, including uh, your wonderful local research, uh, resource, uh, Dr. Guinevere Eden, is talking about that in the not so far future, portable fMRI machines are going to be available. Right now, they cost several million dollars, so maybe we need to get the PTA on that, get us a, I don't know. But the, the technology on brain imaging has increased in, in, in phenomenally changed in the last few years, which has phenomenally changed what we know about how students learn. We can now take pictures of students' brains while they're actually working, live active imaging, and it's non-invasive. We used to have to shave the head and implant electrodes. We don't have to do that anymore. Little, little kids can just lie down in this machine and they don't even have to lie all that, uh, per, um, that still. What we've learned from this is the amazing capacities of our brains to learn things that they haven't learned. Uh, uh, neuropsychologists uh, call that neuroplasticity, because this is all about learning. Uh, Jack Fletcher, one of my colleagues, says, what teachers do is brain surgery. <laughs> brain surgery by instruction. He said, there's increasing evidence. I mean, we just know this now. It's just a fact. Teaching changes brains. It does not change the structure of the brain. We'll leave that to the neurosurgeons. But teaching changes the function of the brain and it changes it permanently. You want to see what teaching does to kids? This is uh, one study um, done with only eight children. A lot of these studies where we actually look at the brain are done with very small numbers of children because um, it's just so expensive to get time on those machines. Eight students, but I really like this study because some of them uh, were very young, seven years old, and it went all the way up to 17. They took pictures of these kids' brains. They already knew they were severely dyslexic. They took pictures of these kids' brains and then gave them a reading test. Then they did eight weeks of intensive instruction, took a picture of their brains eight weeks later and gave them a reading test. On, in terms of the reading test, after eight weeks, they got much better at decoding words. That's good. That's, we like to see that, and only eight weeks can make that kind of difference. But what was also very excited is to see that their brains had changed in eight weeks, whether they were seven years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. What we see typically in dyslexic brains is that the activity trying to read, so these kids were being, the images were being taken while the children were trying to read and the activity was happening in most of the activity in their right hemisphere. That's not where reading is supposed to happen. Reading is a language activity. I need mnemonics these days to remember anything. Language activity, left hemisphere, okay? Language, left. Dyslexic kids try so hard to do this work and they try to do it often in their right hemisphere. Looks what happens with instruction. Eight weeks of instruction. We're not done in eight weeks, but what you can see in both of these students is now when they're asked to read, most of the activity is happening in the left hemisphere, which it should. What we want is after a lot of good instruction, the amount of work, all that red area is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller because they'll get more efficient at reading. We have Numerous studies now that keep showing the same thing. Kindergarten students, first grade students, good instruction changes brains. So, 
here she's back again, our skeptical professional educator and parent. So if we want to raise the reading achievement of our students, what really makes the difference? Well, what really makes the difference, this is what successful schools are doing, pay attention to the standards, collect the right assessment data, share it and use it. Organize your classroom, plan instruction and deliver good instruction. Leadership supports that, we sustain our commitment for that, we launch this sailboat in a, in a safe harbor for our students. We can do this. We can do this. You can do this. And you must do this. It's our job. We have a lot of things to do, but we've got to teach our students to read, right? Let's go out and do that. Thank you. Thank you so much.